And we may assume for simplicity that these are um, non negative integers. And we are also given a, a capacity. Um, we call it the capacity of the NAPSI. And again, we assume for simplicity that is. Uh, Non negative integer. Now, the goal is to compute uh, a set of items um, whose total capacity is at most B and such that the reward is maximized. Okay, so this is a very well-known problem in a deterministic case. There is a beta for it, that's it for, yeah, I mean, it is an mp hard problem, but for every epsilon greater than zero, you can find a one plus epsilon approximation in polynomial time in the input and one by epsilon. But the problem we are considering today uh, involves some randomness. So we are going to assume that both SI, SI and RI are random variables. <laughs> um, yeah, so are random variables for each I, SI and RI can be correlated. And we will assume through this talk that um, for every pair of distinct items, um, the corresponding values for each item are independent. And now the goal will be to compute, um, to, to come up with an algorithm that maximizes the expected value we can obtain um, by inserting these items into the knapsack. So in particular, we will assume that we will insert one item at a time. Once an item is inserted into the knapsack, its size gets instantiated. So we don't know what its size is going to be before we insert it. But just once we insert it, then the size gets instantiated. Um, if the total size so far is at most B, we will we collect the reward from that item. But if that item um, overflows the knapsack, then we don't collect any reward from that item. But you can keep going. No, if you, if you overflow the knapsack, you, you are done. So you, you can view this as a, as a setup in which the knapsack is like a machine and the items are jobs. So you start scheduling these jobs. You don't know how time will they take before you, you schedule them. And if, if, one, if one job uh, makes you wrong over time, you, you are done. It's, it's good. Okay. Okay. So, Okay. 
ट्रेड सो दे आर गोइंग टू आई विल गो आई विल शो यू टुडे कम इस एलपी बेस सो आई विल डिफाइन एलपी एंड देन आई विल एक्सप्लेन व्हाट द वेरिएबल्स मीन Okay, so here, um, this thing over here is a constant that represents the expected value obtained from item i. Okay, we schedule it at time t. So in particular, um, by the law of total expectation, the thing is equal to um, Right. It's, it's the expected value that we can obtain from that item if we scale that time t. So um, in this sum, we only consider the times t prime that are at most d minus d. So those those processing times that um, do not overflow the NAPSEP. Um, yeah, don't worry more, too much about this quantity. All we care is that that's the expected value that we obtain from item i if we scale it at time t. And XIT, this would represent um, the probability that we schedule item I at time T. So this is this is the relaxation. Um, so this is for, for every this constraint for, for every i. These constraints are for every t between one and b. So I guess are we we're assuming that the jobs don't have processing times. Sorry. So do the jobs the jobs don't have? Oh, um, this is not side. No, no, okay. Thank you. Um. We have a lot of, of variables and constraints here because um, we we have a like a, a variable for each for every item and every possible time t between one and d. So 
this is not really polynomial in the input. I could assume B is given in binary, but later on, I will, uh, yeah, I will, I will show you how, how can one get an approximate, approximately optimal solution for this LP in polynomial time. So let's not worry about, about it for now. And okay, so let's see why this is a valid relaxation. Can I ask a quick question, actually? Um, what information about SI and RI like, do you have access to? So we, we just know their probability distributions. Oh, we know you are the distribution. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. They are given to us. And other okay. than that, they are just arbitrary. Okay. They may be different between the items. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, you said that just press the button and turn it on. Hi. Ah, uh, here we go. Uh, not much, but all. Oh, yeah. Yes. But why do we need to concern about the time? Why do we need a time in the world? Oh, that's a that's a good question. So, for instance, um, in the paper that I presented previously. We assume that the rewards were deterministic. Well, either deterministic or independent from the processing times. In that case, um, some of these were considered that didn't consider the, the processing times. So in particular, the, the LPs that were considered, one of them was of this form. Um, So one of the LPs, which was quite natural, look at like this, um, arrives there word of pi, which is deterministic. Let's assume it's deterministic. And this mu i is like a, a, a truncated expected value of the minimum of x i and b. This, this LP was based on the, on the natural LP for the deterministic problem. So in the deterministic problem, um, like one natural LP for this would be, would be right? So this is like like the it guarantees that. Um, or, or variables are between zero and one, and this constraint ensures that the capacity of the knapsack is not violated, and this is what we are trying to maximize. So if you if you replace the excise, like if, if you only allow the excise to have integral volumes between zero and one, this is precisely the knapsack problem, right? In the integral case. And so one one the optimal solution for this problem is to first order the items according to their density. So you you assume um, you assume that the items are, are ordering this way. And then your optimal solution will be to 
start packing the items in this order as much as you can. So if you can pack all of item one, then do it. And then you keep going to the next item until you uh, overflow capacity, in which case you only pack a fraction of the current item. And so that's, that, that, that gives you an optimal solution for the LP. And a natural two approximation algorithm would be to consider um, one of two sets, either um, the set of items that you manage to pack completely in this in the LP solution, or the item that make you overflow the capacity. So you, you pick the better the, the best of those two items of those two sets, sorry, and that will give you a two approximation. But um, and yeah, and the and the the paper from last time I'll consider this LP, which is also natural. And the solution was very the, the algorithm working in a very similar way. It either is a, it either only pick one item, maybe not the one that makes you go over capacity, but it, it either only pick one item or it started to schedule the items in this order. But there are examples. Um, like if you assume that the that the rewards, if you assume that the rewards are correlated with the sizes, there are examples in which um, the integrality gap of this can be arbitrarily bad. So perhaps I will write the example and you can think into your own, but if you let's say um you have an items and let's assume that we probably be um let's assume that S SI is equal to n we probability one by n and in which if that happens then the reward if the size is n then the reward of i is one and otherwise the size of i for every item i is, is one with probability one minus one by n, in which case the reward is zero. So you can think about this example and this, this will, you will see that, that if you consider this LP again, but instead you replace like this deterministic reward with the expected value of the reward or something similar, You'll see that you, you'll get um, uh, an arbitrarily large integral gap. So, so, and that's because like all, all items are competing to be scheduled first. Because um, in here, the only way to obtain reward, ah, sorry, and the capacity, the capacity. In this example, the only way to obtain reward is if the first is if the first item is scheduled first. And sorry, if, if the first item uh, instantiates to size n. If the first item instantiates to size one, then well, you don't get you don't get any reward for that item, and all the, all of the other items will not get any reward. So yeah, all, all items are tired of competing to be scheduled first. So that's why um, algorithm yeah algorithms for for the NAXA problem assuming correlations uh, involve variables for, for the times in which you schedule the item. That, that's like a motivation for it. Um, Well, let's let's show that this is a, a valid relaxation and and the optimal value of the LP. Um, is at least um, 
the optimal value of an optimal algorithm. We will call this, this algorithms adaptive policy. They are called adaptive because adaptive means that um, you are allowed to make decisions once um, after you start processing the items. So adaptive in this case means that, okay, I, I put an item into the knapsack, its size gets instantiated, and then based on that outcome, I am allowed to decide what to do next. Non-adaptive means that I, I can only compute a sequence of a sequence of items before I started scheduling, and then I, I need to process them in that order. So, um, yeah, yeah. That's, that's why your 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 variable is a probability, right? Because at the end, like, they are policies a random process. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. Well, it is clear that constraint three is satisfied if, if um, let's say we fix um, um, adaptive algorithm. A and let x a b b as before. If we pick some some adaptive algorithm and then we let x a b b as before for that algorithm, when it's clear that one and three satisfy, so three all probabilities are non-negative and one we yeah we can only schedule an item once. So this is um, this sum of probabilities is at most one. And perhaps the most yeah the most crucial constraint is are these constraints. So let's show why that holds. Um, so let L T be the random variable. That indicates the item, the last item that is scheduled at or before 20. And let's define some indicator random variables quickly. Um, let, let this thing and this thing be the indicator random variables that indicate whether we schedule item i at time t. And this one indicates whether the size of i is s. So. And the, the same goes for this. Okay, now with these definitions in mind, um, we have 
that the, the sum of the the sum of the sizes of the items that are scheduled before LT is at most T, right? So we can write that down in the following way. What this constraint is saying is that the size of the items scale before LT is at most T. Should be IT prime, or the indicator I. Okay. okay. Um, so in particular, if this happens, um, So that if this happens, then this also happens. Right? Now, um, well, if this happens, then now we are allowed to include item LT. Why why are we doing I not equal to LT in start? Sorry? Like why are we excluding LT? Oh so this this I just want to, to write an equation for saying that the amount of time we have used we have used before scheduling LT is at most T. Okay, because and I guess the LT item could exceed T. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so so I I yeah I excluded LT from this sum just so that I am allowed to do this. To replace S with the minimum of S and T. You can't do that with LT. No. Why? I mean it, 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 so if I include LT, this is not going to be at most T. Starting from the because the last item could exceed things. Yes. Yeah. So, so LT is defined as the run. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It's the last item yeah, that is scheduled yeah, yeah, after yeah. before ten T. Yeah. Yeah. It's fine. Is it okay? Yeah. I, I'm kind of confused still. Like, why? Why is it okay to have uh, items I that are greater than LT in that sub? Oh, I mean, um, oh, this will not be scheduled. They. Because yeah. of the indicator, like right? The right. Indicator so the indicator would just be zero. So yeah. it doesn't matter. This will okay. be yeah. Okay. Um, this. Right. If I include I can multi. Oh. Right. Um, well, I, I don't want to spend much time on this now, but yeah, what follows is just apply expected values on both sides of this equation. And using the fact that these two random variables are independent, because like the, the size of an item doesn't depend on the time that item is scheduled. So, Using the independence of those two things, like uh, you'll see that the expected value of this thing over here is, is exactly this. Um, yeah, it's straightforward. Um, 
And regarding the the the, the objective function of the LP, oh, sorry. the objective function of the LP, uh, you see that the expected reward for algorithm A well, is it's exactly this. So you, you just need to use some probability arguments. It's not that hard, but I will not explain it with a lot of time. Um, okay. So let's leave that there. Oh, now let's consider an algorithm. Suppose we have an approximately optimal solution. We are going to define some quantities for each item i. For each item I, we define this di. Um, we assign we assign to it a value of t with probability x i t by c, where c is some constant to be optimized later. And otherwise, we let di be infinity with the remaining probability. Um, okay. Now let's let's assume that we relabel the vertices. Sorry, that we relabel the jobs. Um, and increasing order of the DIs. Um, okay, so what we are going to do is we will go through the items in this order. And depending on the outcome seen so far, we will decide to schedule the current item or not. So note that this is an adaptive policy. It's not non-adaptive. Um, So for we go we go to the items in this order and for each i between one to n, if the last scale item is running at time di, then we will ignore item i forever, and otherwise we would scale i. 
and we will schedule live as soon as we can. Like it, not like. Um, I'm, I'm, in this sense, we're assuming that the i is not infinity. So Schedule i at the i. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so we, if the last schedule item i is running at time di, we will ignore it. And otherwise, we schedule i as long as di is not infinity. And we will schedule it as soon as we can. So, Let's let's see what what's the expected reward that we obtain from this. Let me just here you are like sampling the DIs, but your sampling has nothing to do with the actual algorithm, right? You're doing like some like randomization before. So I I saw the LP approximately. Okay. And I define for each I I define this DIs with this probabilities. Ah, okay. You already computed the actual value of the di. Di is a real number. Okay, I thought it was like the random variable. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the i's are, are random variables, but after this step is completed, the i's have been assigned already to each. This is the algorithm here. It does it only based on? Ah, okay, sorry. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so. So if uh, if di is infinity, you also ignore i. Yeah, yeah, you ignore it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um. So let di be the, the value obtained from itemizing. Let's yeah, let's find a bound for the expected value of the i. So um, we have that the expected value. Uh, yeah, that like the expected reward for this algorithm is the sum of the of the expected value of the di's by linearity of expectation. So let's let's find a bound for this expected di's. Um, so, like the law of total expectation, we have that these expected DIs are equal to this one. Right. Now, this this value over here, the expected reward that we obtain from item i, if the i is t and if i is schedule, note that this is um, this will be at least this. The expected value of thing from item i if we scale it at times, right? Because if we if we schedule item i, I mean if these conditions are satisfied, the i equal t and i scheduled, then we schedule item i at a time that is at most t. So yeah, that thing is. Um, at least this. And this thing the 
sequence of the probability that the i is equal to t times the probability that i is scheduled even that the i is t. So this thing, um, like this part in the algorithm, this is equal to xit by c. Um, this thing, I don't have time to explain why, but the proof involves using Markov's inequality. This thing is, a, is going to be at least one minus two by c. So yeah, you just need to use Markov's inequality for, for proving this. And so in particular, like the value of C, the optimal value of C in this case is, is four. Um, so we have that this expected DI is at least um, is some. All of these times uh, one by eight. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, and now if we sum over all the i's, then we will see that we we have that the um, the expected reward of the algorithm is at least the expected reward from this solution by eight. So. If, if, if XIT is an optimal solution for the LP, this will give us an eight approximation. Um, yeah, as I say, that LP is too large. So um, maybe we cannot solve it in polynomial time. There is a way of finding an approximately optimal solution. Um, yeah, I think I can go quickly over that. Um, can I erase this? So okay. we we so in here know that we don't need XIT to be optimal. So XIT can be arbitrary, so like and it can be an arbitrary feasible solution, and the expected value we obtain based on that XIT is going to be at least the value obtained by of, from XIT by it. So all this left to show is that we can solve that approximately in polynomial time. So now instead of considering one variable except like for every item i and every time t, we will only consider the times t that are powers of t. And um, in that case, xi 2j could be viewed as the probability of scheduling. I um, at some time P between between the J and between the J plus one. Not necessarily the case, but we can view it in that way. Um, so let's consider this okay.
in similar discipline. Now we have a polynomial number of constraints and variables in the input. Don't worry too much why some of these are j plus one instead of j. Things just work that way. Um, okay, so let's show that. Uh, let's call this LP, this thing LP prime, and this thing LP. So we have that. Um, LP is always better so the the price is in the middle. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We have this. So you can see quickly what move this first. Let x i t be optimal for p. Let's define um, the x i to j in this form. Okay. Let's define let's define the xi to j's in this world. And yeah, so I mean if some p like based on the definition of this sum, some p is larger than b, then just define xi to c. So well it is clear that the first constraint is satisfied. So I mean with that definition, the first constraint will be at most one by four. And the three constraint, the third constraint is also satisfied. So let's quickly see why this one is satisfied. Um, This mm -hmm.
right? This thing is equal to this thing. I'm gonna go really quickly over this. Sorry. Um, this thing, well, is at most this thing. And well, and by the definition of our P there, that thing is at most two times two j plus two minus one all by four, and this is at most two times two to the j plus one. So this is satisfied. And yeah, it's straightforward to show the bound on the objective uh, function. So let's skip that. Um, so um, essentially, yeah, but we but we have that this x bar, this x bar solution, this uh, yeah x bar solution achieves a value if in, in this LP. That is at least the value of xip in that LP by four. So in part, yeah. So in particular, if xip is optimal, then we get this inequality. For the other inequality, well, we now need to assume we have a an optimal solution, let's say, for this LP, and from that optimal solution, we we. We convert that into a feasible solution for that, achieving the same expected, um, achieving the same value in there. Um, oh yeah, I will not prove why it works, but the definition in that in that case would be uh, if the this is in two to the j. Into the J plus one, and if this is given, um, then one can define X I T um, and this. Xi bar to J by two to the J. So that's why I see that one can view this Xi to J as the probability of scheduling I at some time T that is between two to the J and two to the J plus one. Um, yeah, and this with this definition is like the proving feasibility is straightforward and proving the bound as well. So, um, so in order to get an algorithm that runs in polynomial time. What we do is we compute an optimal solution for this LP that has polynomial size in the input. Then you transform that solution into a feasible solution for the large LP. And then you, you run the algorithm. Yeah, so that's, that's all. <laughs> And, and who is a factor of four in the approximation? If that happens, right? Can you do like one plus epsilon, like instead of two raised to powers of two? Can you do like one powers yeah. of one plus epsilon and yeah. lose like? Uh, yeah, I think you could do this probably. Yeah. So you can yeah, get like one plus epsilon approximation. I, I think that's the case. I would think about it. Uh, one thing. This last idea is quite cute, right? Because here the problem is that like your your all the times that you have there are too many, and then you just pick log of them and you call it a day. What I find like kind of weird is that like the log ones that you're choosing. Why do your intervals grow like exponentially? I feel like the first thing that I would try would be like to to have them like uh, uniformly. Like do you know like why that would break? Like because yeah, some idea why that's. Mm -hmm. But won't it not 
solve the issue like that would be a, we want maybe, to yeah, oh, yeah that's a good question i would say that you, you may want to to give more importance to the intervals that are at the beginning okay because maybe the, the example that, that i gave, gave you okay like in which you can only get a, a reward if the first item gets instantiated to a certain size and other than that you don't get any work so maybe you, you may want to give priority to those first intervals and that's why the, the first intervals are shorter no, I, I, I think what makes polynomial is that we just break and, and plug key into one, right? Yeah. So like if yeah. you yeah. just plug all the numbers, spread them out even. Yeah. Oh, I see. I see. So but then, yeah, the, the, the reason that like it goes exponentially. And then it makes sense with like what Rian was saying, right? You could break exponentially with other exponents, like one plus. Right. But if you're breaking uniformly, how do you get rid of the law? No, no, I'm, I'm saying like, uh, the explanation that David gave that we prioritize the first choice blends well with the idea of like using something else other than two from like one plus epsilon because then it would always be exponential. It would also be exponential. Yeah, but like, like you're saying like do it uniformly. Wouldn't that like yeah, let's say in log b, yeah, or so just log the, b, the, the, also like b by log b, yeah, like each yeah, interval is b by log. But yeah, I think that would not work. Okay. Because Yes. Oh, thank you. Okay. Uh, do they speak about the uh, adaptivity gap at all? Uh, so, yeah, they do not. And the reason is that so the algorithm is, is not non adaptive. Yeah. You're making decisions along the way. I mean, it, it's what is called an ordered adaptive algorithm in the sense that you pre compute a sequence of the items and you process them in that sequence, in that order. But uh, you can decide whether to schedule the item or not. Once you oh. go through that sequence, oh. so this is this is not non adaptive, uh, and I, yeah, I think for that reason they, they talk about it. They don't talk about it. Yeah. Okay. So same sequence, but you can choose to skip over. So yeah, yeah. And once you skip an item, you you cannot go back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that's so. Those kind of things are called ordered adaptive algorithms. You pre-compute a sequence, but you are allowed to decide whether to schedule things or not. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, is LQ prime easier to solve than uh, the Yeah, so the 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 issue with this is that if B is given in binary, you you do want I mean you can solve binary P as long as the in polynomial time, as long as the number of variables and constraints are polynomial in the input. But if you you have if B is given in binary, then this will have an exponential number of constraints and variables. So that's why. Um, if you want to solve that approximately and efficiently, then you may need to uh, how to solve this? Yeah. Or you can run the simplex. Yeah. Not really true, but the most optimal way of solving it will be. But now you have a number of constraints and variables that is polynomial in the input. And uh, in previous. Uh, how do you mention a C? C equals to four. Why is four? Oh, because. And the, what's the C? Yeah, there, there was a. Uh, so, given, given uh, let's say we have a, an, an XIT that is feasible for that OB. If you run the algorithm for that with that XIT, then the expected reward that you obtain based on that XIT is going to be at least. Uh, let's say the the reward of XIT times uh, one by C times one by minus two by C. So you want to maximize this one oh, okay. for resistance. Do you think it might be possible to improve the algorithm so that you get something better than one eight? Like, do you think you, there could be a p test for this? So there is a two plus epsilon approximation um, by one one. 
but they'll, they'll be maybe too large. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe too large, so maybe the algorithm doesn't run for a number. Uh, yeah, the idea is, is very similar. So, like, instead of considering this constraint, um, you consider a constraint that indicates that at time there is at most one item run. So, that would be very. Something like this. Yeah, I think that's okay. So, so uh, yeah. if, if, if you define the XIT cell before, the probability of scaling like MI or time T, then yeah, this is what indicates that at time T, there is at most one item going. And this, yeah, this considering this constraint alone instead of the, all of these constraints can be uh, more useful in certain ways. In fact, that, that's the constraint. Well, uh, something similar to that is what will make it. Are there any more questions? So, yeah, that is like the, the only reason we care about this is because um, this constraint allows you to use markups inequality. Right? Mm -hmm. That's the, the sole purpose of that. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, well, I don't know.